If you guys would introduce yourselves and, and tell these folks uh, who you are and come, you can come join me, it's okay. All right, I am, uh, I'm Brett Heinrich. I'm a CT supervisor in Tennessee. The school district I work for is Carville Schools, a suburb right, so, right outside of Memphis. I have 14 years in public education uh, as CT supervisor, director, been there for four years in that role. Uh, our high school has 19 different CTE programs to study. One of them is an aviation flight and maintenance program. Uh, we do have uh, a six through eight aviation flight program through our Project Lead the Way curriculum. Um, and we are partnered with uh, the University of Memphis for flight at the high school level for dual enrollment, and then Tennessee College of Applied Technology for our maintenance program. And we are the only full, as of this year, the only full aviation maintenance uh, program that exists in the state at the high school level where students can finish their general certificate on our campus. And for our flight program, students can earn their private pilot's license by the time they graduate, before they graduate, and all that is paid for through a grant, so students do not currently have to pay uh, for any of the things that I just mentioned. So uh, that's specific to aviation. That's kind of what we do and uh, kind of my why. Uh, I was not a CTE educator. I was a social studies teacher, football and baseball coach, then an assistant principal at our high school, got asked to step into the uh, CTE uh, director role. I've learned a lot over the last four years, but uh, this really has reinvigorated my why because we are putting kids on pathways to, to careers, uh, to you know earning high wages, that are sustainable for their entire career. So uh, yeah, a little bit of background about me. Uh, Kate Barnett, Director of Education for Gates Aerospace Institute with Embry-Vidal, uh, background in secondary CTE, um, and we do curriculum development, and we'll be going into that in a little bit. Uh, hi, uh, Chris Peterson. I am a career educator, 26 years in the public high school classroom, and I've uh, started two different aviation programs, uh, two separate schools, one in California and Corona, California, and uh, now I'm currently at Liberty Creek High School in Gallatin, Tennessee, and I'm also a CFI, I, MEI, uh, with a couple thousand flight hours, so I'm kind of, kind of uh, both roles here. Hi, Bob Hepp, uh, I'm the owner, founder, and uh, chief instructor for Aviation Adventures. Uh, we're a flight school in Northern Virginia. We've got five locations uh, throughout the Northern Virginia area. Uh, started as a CFI back in 1981. Uh, started the flight school in 89 uh, while I was in the Army. I retired from the Army in 98 in the D.C. area and then uh, continued to grow the flight school there. Uh, right now with the five locations, uh, we're all 141 school. We've got examining authority. Uh, for everything up through CFII, which makes life real easy, guys. If you can do it, do it. Uh, and uh, we've got 11 uh, 141 programs. We've got, uh, we're affiliated with Liberty University. Uh, we're working on Shenandoah University and then also Purdue Global. So um, happy to be here. Thanks, Bob. Hi, I'm Joey Collarin, and I'm with Boeing Global Services. I'm a private pilot and um, very passionate about aviation. My, my background is business development and advocacy. Um, I serve as our industry relations manager, um, and it's Legacy Jeppesen is where I live in Boeing, so a lot of people that use the Jeppesen products are familiar with that. Um, I um, am very passionate and excited to be here. Um, prior to Boeing, I worked for River Flight Simulations, and um, I really, oh, thank you, Charlie, yeah. And, and I, I was focused on the education market, so thank you. Thanks, guys, really appreciate it. Um, so, Joey, let's start with you. Um, you, okay. you, rep you represent the biggest name of all of us in the world, Bob's getting close on Boeing. It'll, pretty soon you're, you're just gonna call, you'll just, the name HEP, it'll be like Boeing, like you, it'll be at that level. Um, so I think all of us are familiar with the work Boeing does to do uh, forecasting on workforce needs. Can you just hit quickly, um, let's talk about, the, let's just get the problem out of the way first so okay. we can just talk about the problem. All right, well the problem is we need a lot more people in aerospace. <laughs> And the panel's done, guys. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we, we actually produce a handful of Outlook reports, market reports, but the one I'm going to talk about right now is our pilot technician Outlook. Um, this is 20, 
2022 data. Um, 20, 2023 will come out uh, later this year, hopefully during um, Air Venture. Um, but right now, um, we need 602,000 pilots in the next 20 years, 610,000 maintenance technicians, and over 899,000 cabin crew um, employees. So it's a, and, and that, those numbers don't include business and general aviation needs or um, civil helicopter, which I guess is GABA. That's but, just, that's nuts. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. And that, so that is worldwide, but it does exclude some regions um, because we aren't able to do business in those regions right now. Um, that, um, that's a 3.4% increase from um, 2001. Um, and so we, I'm sure we're going to see some pretty interesting numbers coming out this year. Um, we've been doing this uh, report for 12 years, since 2010, and it really does help the industry look at where we're going and what we need. And significantly to your point about worldwide versus, you know, regional, you know, every year it's over 100,000 pilots just in North America. Um, that's kind of nuts. And I don't know if everybody here is familiar with this, but... Um, Many of you guys know the name Jason Blair. Maybe some of you guys follow him, and um, he's a, a longtime DP, long-term friend, Duke, great guy. Um, but he put out an article recently about just some of the trends that are happening in commercial aviation hiring. Um, and, and if you've already read this, you can tune out for a minute, but, but come back because we're going to talk about more stuff. So what... We generally talk about this need for people, and we often don't close the loop on the people who are exiting the industry. We, we talk a lot about incoming folks, um, but you almost have to go to separate data sources to figure out, okay, but how, how, many, how many of those people we need are filling backfills versus new folks? And I love that Boeing actually talks about that and helps sort of get through some of that data. But you know, Jason pointed out in an article not too long ago that if you look at the number of ATP certificates issued in the last five years or so, excluding 2020, we put out somewhere between four and 6,000 ATP certificates, which is, you know, that it sort of goes up and down. And obviously not all of those new ATP certificates are going to become airline pilots, but I mean, that's obviously big, a big thing. So when you go and look at retirement data though, we're also losing between five and 5,700 pilots. So all this work that we're doing right now to generate pilots and to build that workforce, just that myopic look, we're only barely covering our exits. Like we're not, we're not scaling for growth. And, if, and what you're saying is if every time this report comes out, it's increasing the number of people we're going to need, you know, it's, it's an issue. I would agree with that statement. And I just wonder, like, so Bob, you have a unique position in that you need workforce because you operate a flight school, but obviously you have a high volume flight school, so you're also supplying that workforce too. Can you talk about the balance? I mean, obviously we're not talking about ATPs and retirements. We're talking about the earlier part of the, the, uh, the pilot life cycle, but what does that look like for you? What do you see in that? Like, are you able to, to maintain? And, and even if you can maintain, can you grow? Uh, yes, you can, and the, uh, that's the good news. The, the really good news about what we do is that uh, we're making dreams come true. People come to us with the dream of getting into aviation, either at the recreational level or at the professional level, and we get to enable those dreams. It's not like a doctor who gets to fix them when they're sick or a lawyer if they get into some kind of trouble. Uh, we're dream makers. So, uh, People that come to us, just like everybody in this room, is passionate about what they do. So we can leverage off of that and, and build our own employee set. Uh, so a lot of the people that are working their way up uh, then become, when we need a, a CSR at the front desk of our locations, uh, we take that from within. There's somebody who is knowledgeable about aviation in some way or another, they may be a private pilot, a student pilot, but they're working their way up. Then they, um, uh, they can talk intelligently to people who call with questions about, okay, what's the flight training process like? 
So those people are invaluable uh, sitting on the desk answering those kinds of questions. Then they eventually will get their uh, instructor certificate and so they know what the person sitting on the desk has been doing. They know how to answer those questions. They know the needs of the people walking in the door better than somebody that just got their certificate and didn't have that experience. So then uh, we, most of our instructors, we build in-house because we don't have to train them on how to do things the way that we like them done. Uh, on the maintenance side, we saw maintenance uh, becoming an issue a while ago, and uh, the one of the main maintenance shops uh, that was owned by a friend of mine, uh, he said he was getting ready to turn the next chapter in his life and move on, uh, move out of the state, and uh, he said, hey, how would you like to buy my maintenance operation? I said, no, I need you to stay there doing what you're doing. I don't want to get into the maintenance operation. He said, okay, well... Uh, one of your competitors is nosing around wanting to buy it. And I said, how much do you want? <laughs> because if he went out of business, we would be, we would be in dire trouble. Because right now, uh, I was talking to Josh the other day, uh, our main limiting factor, we can make more instructors. We can, uh, students is not a problem. Uh, I don't know if I want to open up another facility or not, but the uh, right now, if I had 50 more airplanes, it's not going to do much to make more aircraft availability. What it's going to do is make a bigger backlog of airplanes sitting out in front of the hangar waiting to go in for maintenance because the throughput there. The, that's the one difficult problem that we've got right now is solving that because the airlines who have a need for 610,000 uh, aircraft technicians, they're going into these uh, places that train people for their a &P certificates and saying, okay, all of you folks, how would you like a job that starts with this kind of pay, has this kind of time off, and has these kind of travel benefits and these kind of health benefits? I can't compete with that. So we've got to find the people that want to stay real local, and then we've got to make them real happy as happy as we can make them to, to stay there so that uh, we've got some kind of stability in the, in the maintenance force. So it's a lot of uh, growing from within uh, is how we've chosen to solve the problem and it's worked real well. It's really cut down on the uh, amount of work when we have to hire folks from outside and, um, and train them. So. What, let me ask a follow-up to that because you opened an interesting door there. So you talked about hiring folks to work the desk, you know, to answer questions, to schedule. And um, again, I'll, I'll pick on Joey first. When, when you say, when somebody says Boeing to me, I see a 737. Like that's, that's what that is to, the, to me. That's what that, that's what that word means. But I don't know if everybody here even knows, you know, what, can you just talk about the Boeing workforce, what that actually is? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So 15 months ago when I started at Boeing, I, I didn't even know just how big Boeing was. And I had gone through the interview process and I thought I had done some good research. So um, I didn't, um, but the, um, so Boeing commercial aircraft is what everybody thinks of. And that is our Seattle home where our engineers and most of our mechanics are, right? Like, that is Boeing. Um, but I'm clearly not a, an engineer. I'm a communications major. And so um, Boeing has 140,000 employees worldwide. So you can have any kind of job at Boeing, and we need them. There's, they hired 15,000 people last year. So whether it's a front desk person at Boeing or an accountant, and there's a lot of opportunity out there that we need. So, so it's, it's bigger than these pilot numbers than, and the mechanic numbers, even though those are our most critical pieces. And I would agree with you, the, the maintenance um, issue is, is, is a high priority for Boeing. Um, but yeah, so then you go from Boeing commercial aircraft in Seattle then where I live is Boeing Global Services, 
And that is um, an entity that has um, Jeppesen, ForeFlight, AirData, Avial, all the legacy long-term um, companies that Boeing has bought over the last 20 years. And so we are truly providing um, like digital services and um, parts and distributions and modifications. So we're, there's a lot within Boeing Global Services. And then Boeing Global Defense in Space, and that's, uh, and that's in um, uh, Virginia, DC basically. Um, and that's their headquarters, and I don't need to explain what defense in space is. That's pretty straightforward. Um, Boeing Global Services headquartered in Plano, Texas. And then the Enterprise um, was once in Chicago, but they, they've now relocated the, the main headquarters to um, our DC office. So it's, it's huge. Um, what I do, there's probably 150 other people doing what I do. Um, and I don't know them all. Nobody does it better, though. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know that yet. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't met them all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll pick on my education friends for a second. So I think, and especially, let me pick on Brett first. So, you know, not an aviation background, classroom teacher, NCT, responsible for aviation programs. I don't think most people would think of the CTE administrator for a school district being an aviation job, but in a lot of ways it is. I went to college to be an airline pilot because that was the only job in aviation I knew existed. After three weeks in college, I was like, I don't want to do this. That's not the lifestyle I want for myself. You know, I, what are the other options? And then I realized that saying you wanted to be a pilot was a lot like saying you wanted to be a doctor. There are a lot of different kinds of doctors, and a lot of them don't even see patients. I'm a pilot, but I don't fly every day for a living anymore. Can you guys, you guys figure out how you want to do this, but talk about being in an aviation field, but not like being in, not being like, you, not legacy aviation, but having an aviation job because you, you do. So that's a, what you guys do are workforce positions in aviation. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I can, I'll take the first stab at this. Thanks for picking on me yep, first, by the sure. way. Um, so just to kind of recap um, the way aviation is working in our district. So holistically, I manage 19 different CTE programs of study. But in the, the reality is, since we implemented this last year at the middle school level and then this school year at the high school level, while also maintaining the middle school program, if you look at the hours that I spend on programs in our district, aviation probably takes up about 50 percent of that time every week. It is a very cumbersome but also very, you know, fulfilling, uh, you know, thing that I have to do week in and week out, mainly because we're still building it, you know, things will su be sustainable here moving forward. But, um, you know, sixth through eighth grade, uh, for our te from the teacher perspective, uh, Redbird has been fantastic in providing training to our teachers, not just on how to use the machines, but also on training them about what does it mean, what does aerospace mean, all the science behind aerospace. When Greg, uh, who's been fantastic, I, I hate that he's not here this week, when Me he too. came down, Me too. I know you did specifically right now. Um, when he came down uh, for a two-day training, the first day was just all about the science of flight and the history of flight because none of our STEM teachers in the middle school level, you know, we're not pilots, we're not aviators, so they had to learn that first. And he was uh, fantastic at that. Uh, and then came back additional times after that and did a full day just on how to use the machines and then some ongoing training after that. So that's how we tackle it, um, how, how we have tackled it at the middle school level. Um, now, also, on top of that, we also really are implementing the, the, the SIMS in our flight and space modules through the Project Lead the Way curriculum in eighth grade, but we went ahead and trained all of our STEM teachers so that any student in STEM would be able to go in and, and be able to use those machines uh, appropriately. So that's the middle school approach that we've taken, and that started last school year and happening again this year, uh, and we've seen some fruits of that now at the high school level. So at the high school, it's not that simple. Um, I know there's, there's, there's been some discussion about, well, how do we, what, what does a teacher do when this curriculum is thrown in their lap? How do they respond to it? In Tennessee, it's not that simple. Uh, we also have workforce development problems. Like everybody else in education, it is hard enough to hire a math or a science teacher right now, let alone a CTE teacher that has to have so many years of experience in welding or be an RN or, in this case, have their private pilot's license or be a CFI. Um, so, you know, we're battling that as well. And uh, the way we approach that is kind of a grow your own. Uh, we work with our partners uh, to try to make it 
um, as flexible and possible for instructors to be on our campus uh, delivering instruction. Uh, what that can look like is through the University of Memphis. Uh, we identify a candidate, they approve them as an instructor, and then they can teach the dual enrollment courses. Um, I know that there are other districts in here, another one from Tennessee that's in here, I learned this this week, um, the same grant that we received to start our aviation program, uh, they used to train some of their teachers to get their private pilot's license so that they could then uh, have their current teachers who have a background in education be able to have the occupational background to teach the flight courses that, uh, that the Tennessee Department of Education provides. So there are a couple of different ways uh, to do that. But specifically, to your point about uh, touching on careers in aviation that are not specifically being a pilot, not specifically being uh, an AMP technician, uh, we have a really, and I talked about this in a session earlier, so if you were in, the, if you were in that earlier, you'll kind of have a repeat. But we're really proud of uh, the partnership we've developed with FedEx as we've implemented this program. Obviously, Memphis is, is home to FedEx, so we have in Collierville, suburb of Memphis, a lot of the pilots live in Collierville. Uh, but also a lot of the the uh, regional offices that FedEx has are also based in Collierville as well. The world headquarters is just right down the street. So all that to say, um, FedEx has been fantastic in helping us get a partnership started for an internship program for our welding program. Uh, long story short, we have about 22 uh, students that will be senior welders, uh, and we've worked out with FedEx, their express division, um, where, we were, where 10 of those 22, or all, however many, can apply to get a paid internship position with FedEx to work at their fab lab at the airport to repair dollies and different items that get damaged, non-motorized vehicles on the tarmac at the airport. And so uh, welding students, uh, 10 of them at least, are going to be getting paid internships all year next year uh, in the fab labs at FedEx with a mentor FedEx welding fabricator um, and getting paid for their experience or getting paid for their, for their job uh, and this is all happening during a work-based learning period at the end of the school day. So we actually give students time. At the end of the day, we're on a block schedule, so that means students uh, can finish a class at the semester, but it also means it frees up their senior year a little bit. They can earn more credits over the course of their high school career. So by the time they're seniors, they have room in their schedule to give them a work-based learning period where they can leave and actually go to a job. And so for our welding kids, working at the airport, repairing dollies and things of that nature, uh, at FedEx, at the airport, uh, that's going to be an awesome opportunity, and we're in the middle of, of finalizing who those 10 students are going to be, and this is the first time that FedEx has done anything like this, and they're choosing our district to do that. Uh, and they've already said if this goes well, it would branch out into other uh, programs of study. Um, but yeah, so th those are some of the things that, that we're doing in terms of workforce and kind of how it works uh, uh, with us in Carville Schools. I, I think being in, you know, in the classroom like I am, the, the biggest challenge is... When kids hear aviation, and, and for you as well, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear about a job in aviation? First thing, it's pilot. Everybody thinks that. And at the, the middle school and even the high school level, they don't realize yet that there is more to flying than just the airline pilot. And so part of my job is to help students understand that, yes, there is, in fact, airline flying. There's also Part 135 or charter type flying. There's also general aviation flying. And yes, those all involve pilots. But in fact, we also need mechanics and so on and so forth. Uh, we utilize the, uh, the AOPA um, high school STEM curriculum. They've done a great job developing that. And one of the things I really uh, like about it is that it goes into some depth on careers other than just uh, the typical, you know, I'd say typical pilot, but other careers. And it's a, it's a chance for kids to realize, whoa, I, I never really thought about that before. And when you see the light bulbs go on, that they really like aviation, but maybe they don't really want to be a pilot. But now we work with our, our other CT programs, our machining and welding people, our mechatronics, et cetera, so that um, students, like let's say they want to be a welder, but they want to work around aviation, great. Another huge, huge resource for us has been the EAA. Our local chapter in Gallatin 1343, uh, they, they are a great group of people, and the EAA chapter has um, made themselves very available to our program. And I've had guest speakers come in. Um, we're getting kids uh, to go to meetings. We've had them attend the, you know, the pancake breakfast. And my, my program just started, by the way, in uh, August of last year. So it's a brand new high school, brand new program. But it's literally up and running and, and doing 
very, very well. So the things like you know the pancake breakfast, um, discovery flights, young eagle flights, uh, that provides exposure. These kids, you know, when they come to the airport, I think somebody said it yesterday, it's, it's not a ticketed event, right? You don't have to go through TSA. You come to the airport. You get to come to the airport. Really? And I get to get up close to an airplane. Wow. I, I'm standing next to this plane. These kids, they, they don't really have a concept of that until you provide that to them. Once they've seen it and, and have been around it, it fuels the passion. I, it sort of sells itself in a way. It's not a hard sell. Um, but then one other thing that I try to instill in my students is, is the soft skills idea, right? And I challenge them to build their network. When we have guest speakers come in, I keep telling the students, I'm like, you got to build your network. Go up and uh, you should get their number. You got to get their email address. You got to go talk with them. You, you literally have to do this. Teach this. You have to teach the kid. Hey, how you doing? Chris Peterson. Pleasure to meet you. And your name? Brett, that's nice to meet you. And I look Brett in the, I demonstrate this in the classroom, it sounds silly, but I show them, this is how you shake hands. This is how you look somebody in the eye. And this is how you acknowledge their existence as a human being and ask follow-up questions. And the things like that, as somebody else uh, said in an earlier presentation, students don't really know how to communicate these days. They, they communicate on their phones. And, and that's, that's super true. But then um, to sit in a cockpit with somebody for three hours or four hours, and have a conversation, let's say, with a captain, how are they going to do that, right? We need to teach them those soft skills, and that, that happens at the seventh, well, elementary level, really. Um, but we really reinforce it there at the high school level. Um, we also have a club, and I had these little seventh and eighth grade kids come up to me, and they're like, Mr. Peterson, sir? I'm like, they said, sir, that's, wow. And I said, yes. And they said, we, we know you have the Aviators Club for high school. Is there any way that we could come to this, sir? I'm like, yeah. What grade are you in? They said, well, we're in seventh grade. And I said, if you can bring a bunch of other kids just like you, absolutely. Well, thank you, sir. We'll be there. And they show up, and, and that's how it starts. And it's just sparking. It just sparks the passion. And then my job is literally I'm a tour guide. I look at myself kind of like, hey, let me just show you all of this stuff. Let me take you through this. Let me introduce you to, to things that you probably didn't even know existed. And then let me introduce you to people who can help, help, help you run with this. You want to be a, a mechanic? Great. Let's introduce you to those people. You want to be a fabricator? Great. There you go. So that's kind of what we're doing. So um, with Embry-Riddle, we offer dual enrollment, and we do it as a concurrent model. Um, students don't know what they don't know. Um, and... Previous to coming to Embry-Riddle, I did career planning with, with students 6th um, through 12th grade. So I think one of the great things that we do to bring the variety of jobs that are available in aviation and aerospace is we offer over 30 different course offerings from almost all of our colleges on campus, engineering, manned, unmanned, business, human factors, even social, uh, social studies and history. So we provide that acceleration opportunity in a rigorous classroom through our dual enrollment. Well, what we found is our schools asked for more for those schools that couldn't credential uh, an instructor or we weren't able to provide an instructor, they asked for high school programming. So we have, we're building space. We do uh, unmanned as well as there. So even if they're not able to take advantage of the dual enrollment, we are providing curriculum opportunities. Now down into middle school, we have an eighth grade course that provide a survey of different things um, that happen in aviation. We also partner with business. So Ember Air exec Executive Jets in developing curriculum uh, for a Fusion 360 industry certification. Uh, the students had to de design an eVTOL. And then we took them down to Ember Air and they got to meet with the design team there and pitch their uh, designs. Who knew? I mean, these students had no idea that that existed. Uh, we worked with, uh, right now we're working with JKE Works Restoration in Mount Dora, Florida, and the students are designing a pulley, uh, no, the bracket for a pulley uh, that they are currently working on in rebuilding a 1930s Vega. So we are pitching that they're doing a CNC certification on a design element that they will then, again, we'll take them to JKE Works, 
another opportunity in aeronautics that, or aviation that the students would have no idea existed. So we are bringing it to them in the classroom at the dual enrollment, at the high school level, and now at the middle school level. Awesome. Bob, for the flight school operators in the room, can you talk a little bit about your experience specifically in the flight training industry side of this conversation in assisting the community under, to understand the opportunities in flight training? I mean, obviously right now we're all in a, in a market where the phone's probably going to ring because people have heard that there's a job for you. But you've been at this for a long time. And, and I, I know from talking to you over the years that you do a really good job of mobilizing your community to understand that it's, it's not just about getting your private pilot certificate. That's great. It's not just about being a career pilot. But even if you just learn what aviation is, so you become an ambassador, you, want, you can tell people the value of it, and you're one less phone call to the airport complaining about noise later on, you know, those are wins. But can you talk from the flight trainings, particularly about how um, the aids that are available, uh, how these other folks can get involved if they're not already in their community for workforce? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. Thanks. Uh, there's a tremendous number of organizations out there. A number of them have been already uh, discussed. You've got EAA with the Young Eagles program. You've got uh, uh, a lot of other organizations that are out there to give uh, young folks their first opportunity, their first exposure to aviation. And in a lot of cases, uh, like Chris said, it's something that they just never believed was possible before. Uh, so uh, the, uh, what we try to do is align with some of those organizations. Uh, Leslie uh, is involved with the uh, STEM flight organization and, and got us uh, going with them. They've got uh, several locations throughout the country. And there's a lot of other organizations like that. Uh, last year and uh, for the previous uh, three years, I think, and we're looking forward to doing it again this year, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, funded by Walmart, is uh, ha provides the opportunity to uh, she camp, um, uh, soar higher edu explorers, I think, is what she camp stands for. They had to make it that because most of them are women, so it fits. Um, they do let guys in. But the, uh, so we give, um, last year we did uh, 262 half hour adventure flights to the campers, the staff, and also they bring in uh, uh, teachers, uh, educators in to give them that exposure as well. Uh, the, um, we do the same thing on a much smaller scale for uh, uh, OBAP, the Organization of Black it's now aerospace professionals. Um, so uh, a lot of organizations that are out there and a lot of uh, local high schools are looking to stand up their STEM or now STEAM programs and, uh, and it's easy to get involved and help them uh, along the road with that. Um, just to, uh, I'll just put it out there, I, I don't like, uh, you know, providing a problem without the answer, but I, I don't have the answer capacity to fix it myself. Uh, throw it out there, maybe AOPA or, AO, or EAA may pick up the ball and run with it. Uh, we could stand up here and fill these boards with uh, the list of different types of um, uh, opportunities that are available to get people interested in aviation now. Everybody's risen to the challenge. There's been money thrown at it. There's scholarships that go unclaimed every year uh, available to people. Uh, what, uh, and we've had discussions at different levels about uh, what the need is right now. We've got a lot of resources out there. When that person stands up and says, I wanna be an aviation maintenance technician, I wanna be a pilot, I wanna get involved in aviation, I wanna become an air traffic controller. Uh, and the resources available to them are going to vary based on where they live. In some places, there's, uh, I imagine in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, you've got tons of opportunities to get involved with aviation. Northern Virginia, we've got a lot there as well. 
But uh, if somebody comes up and can check in with one organization and say that this is what I want to get involved in, and then we've got an organization that can say, okay, if you want to take your first flight, let's get you involved with EAA chapter 60, 689, and they're going to take you for a, a Young Eagles flight. Then uh, you can uh, get into this STEM program. You can get into these uh, internship capabilities. Uh, you can uh, get aligned to go to this university ultimately, but create a pathway for that person based on the resources that are available in that area. That's what we need most right now. The resources are out there. It's just that it's uh, we need a an Uber kind of um, matchup uh, system that can knows what those resources are in that specific area and can match the students up with those resources. And uh, so it would be great if somebody could come up, uh, uh, one of the, the larger organizations could fill that need and get people uh, matched up with and aware of the resources that are available in that area. I think right now, as it stands, there's lots of them out there. They just don't, we, we have a problem linking the people yeah. with the resources. Joey? Thanks, Bob. So um, this is not a solution, but just to add to that, um, the FAA had their Youth and Aviation Task Force, um, and one of the recommendations that came out of that in the fall was to have a one-stop shop. So, yeah, you're, you're on it. You are, you're Bob. on it. <laughs> I'm telling you, the HEP name is going to be everywhere, yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. And everywhere. so that is a recommendation that came out and that was reported to Congress um, with the reauthorization bill up right now, maybe they're looking at that. I, I, I can't say. I don't, I don't know. But I do think that you're right, that it's probably industry um, that needs to step up and, and create something like that. We don't want to trust that to the government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and just to, because it's, it, there's always so much that's changing, and it, it really it's a, it would be a dynamic um, whatever it looks like, right, website uh, or whatever. But, yeah, that, that is something um, that is being tossed around, so hopefully somebody will pick it up. So I have a follow-up to your follow-up. Yeah, okay. Stack another one on there. So from we, we've talked about what education's doing. Bob's talked a lot about what flight schools can do. From the industry perspective, I mean, obviously companies have some money. Hopefully they're making good profits and they can throw money to problem, but we all know that that's, it seems like, oh, the problem is the money, but somebody has to use the money effectively. Can you talk about why Boeing is, is interested in filling their own workforce problem and, and sort of what they're doing and why you guys aren't just in a room designing airplanes, but you also realize you have to be out in the community doing your job, exactly? Yeah, of course, I'm happy, happy to. So um, we, Boeing really is making a lot of investments, especially over the last, um, I would say, three, four years. Um, and it's not just for our own workforce. Obviously, it's for the entire industry. We, we need this everywhere because we need pilots and mechanics at our customers, not just internally at Boeing. Um, so, you know, we've, through um, our, it's, it's called Boeing Global Engagement, and they um, give a lot of community grants, um, and they've given some out recently for some STEM programs and some college programs, and it's a really impactful um, um, financial investment in both for Boeing and for that institution and that community um, which it serves. Um, and there's all sorts of outreach programs. Um, you know, I, I get to have a really fun part, fun part of my job is to, to, to work with EAA and work with AOPA and work with other industry organizations on um, their youth program programs, excuse me, and um, we, we, we invest in that both with dollars and with um, people. And so and that's it's... That's important, the people part. Yeah. 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 And um, it's... It takes both. Yeah, and I'd like to, like, it's, it's pretty amazing that for such a huge organization that that grassroots level of, you know, who we are as an aviation company and, mm -hmm. you know, the heart and soul of Boeing... Um, it's, it's pretty fantastic, that the investments that, that we're making. Thank you for that. I want to um, save a little bit of time for questions if we can. So I'll, I'll ask you all one last question. 
um, which for this audience is probably the most obvious question to ask. If you could each say one thing to one young person today, like what, how do you point them in the right direction? Even if it's, what would you say to your young self that you wish you had known that would have impacted you differently? And I'll, I'll start for me. It was to realize that the world is bigger than what I could see with my own two eyes right in front of me. I wish that somebody had explained to me how big and how complex the world is because I was so short-sighted. And I, all I said, I went to college to be an airline pilot and then went, this is not what I thought it was because I didn't know. I didn't know. And I wish that I had, and I, I still remember my first uh, flight lesson the day after my 13th birthday. We took off. We flew over my house. And I know this is going to sound really stupid, but the way my house is built, it was sort of, it's sort of like a, like a U-shaped house and it had sort of a little courtyard in the middle. It never occurred to me that that's what my house looked like until I flew over it. And I looked down at it and I thought, our house is in the shape of a U. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but it, from a perspective standpoint, I mean, you don't see your house from above it. You see it from the ground looking at it and it just looks like a box. But it, that, that fundamentally changed my perception when I was when I was over my house and I could see the lake where I like to spend my summers, and it, it took 20 minutes to get there in a car, but I felt like I could just throw a rock and hit it because it was just right there. That, that visual changed everything for me. And I, I wish that I could go back and tell younger Eric at a younger age, the world is bigger than this. But what's your, what's your thing? You got the mic, go for it. What's your thing? Um, I. I would say um, I wish I had Chris as a teacher because I would, I would tell myself that, um, that to go find somebody that's doing what I think I want to do as 15-year-old Joey or whatever and talk with them and understand what it is that they do because like you, I thought I wanted to be an airline pilot and then I started flight training and I thought, oh, uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Um, and, and quite honestly, I was actually lost for a few years. I was like, what am I going to do now? Like, that was my whole dream. And so I think I would um, really encourage y'all um, to really embrace that for, for youth today, is to help them make those network, make, grow their network so that they know what's out there. Even with the internet, because you, you didn't have the internet when we were in high school, did you? No. Yeah. No. So, Which I, mean, I don't know that that's a bad the, thing, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that I would have but used they, the internet for good when I was in high school. There's, uh, what are there's you laughing still about? Quit a lot laughing. of opportunity for us to, to do that human connection for these kids, and that's what I would do. I, w I wish I would have been a little bit smarter, but that's all right, because I'm here. <laughs> uh, I think we may get a lot of similar answers on this one. Uh, uh, the, the best advice is if you've got a dream or at least a dream that's forming, find that person, whether it's your parents, uh, whether it's a family friend, whether it's somebody at school, uh, find somebody who can help you first off develop that dream and decide a little bit more specifically early on what it is that you want to do. And then from there, uh, if it's the same person or someone else, have them find the person that can help you start on the road to that dream. And that starts with getting in contact with this one-stop shopping agency that uh, it will help you get on that path. Uh, that's which really amplifies the need for that organization, where, whatever it may be. Uh, but, you know, go down uh, until that happens, get with a, an EAA chapter, Get with an organization, uh, the, the She Camp kind of organization. We've got uh, one in Virginia that we support, uh, Pathways, that takes uh, uh, high school juniors and seniors and gets them. Now it's it, they got additional funding. They can take them all the way through their private pilot certificate. So um, find an organization that can do that for you. And and I've got to say, we, we talked about making dreams come true. The other part of it is, is that when we've got people who are coming out of high school who are just getting into college and, and they latch on to aviation, that is their thing. It's 
looking back as those people come through and they, they become uh, instrument pilots and commercial pilots, um, uh, CFIs, and then it's amazing to watch these people just to develop as adults right in front of your eyes. All brought around, uh, built around their passion for aviation. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning is, uh, is watching that happen to individual people. But find, they need to find the person that can help them develop that dream and then follow through on it. So. Thanks. Imagine you're going to hear a little bit more of the same. <laughs> um, we were just out at Sun and Fun in Lakeland, and um, Dave Moorfield, uh, we had set up simulators. So we had students, little guys, on the simulator taking off, flying around. Um, and I, was, I had the drone, so I learned a lot about our drone models. Um, although I'm education director, I, I got a really fast learning, and just having the students come up, the uh, different kids come up, and had never held a drone, and then you tell them it's a $5,000 drone, they're like, ah, you know. <laughs> but just to give them that tactile experience, to give them that simulated experience, and uh, one of my favorite sayings, uh, having come on board, is from Mr. Moorfield, uh, the art of the possible, and having done career, uh, career research with students is not closing doors on yourself. Where you make dreams come true, we inspire as educators. We give the art of the possible as a gift to the students that we impact on a day-to-day -day basis. So to my younger self, much like you were saying, just don't close doors on, on yourself. Be inspired and think of what can be, what's next for you, and what sets you on fire. Yeah, um, you know, so I am a parent of three small children, so I'm like in the midst of, you know, giving motivational advice, everything. I have an eight-year-old son, my uh, middle daughter will be six in July, and then I have a two-year-old. So uh, I think about this thing quite a bit, and the best, yeah, I know, pray for my wife, actually, she deserves that right now. Um, but really the best advice that, and this is uh, kind of cliche, but, um, and you may have heard it before, but really just uh, the phrase I use is just do it. Um, it's, I think a lot of times we let the fear of failure prevent us from doing what we are truly passionate about. Um, and, and I, and that's one of the great things that STEM and CTE does is through the hands-on learning experience, students are going to fail quite a bit, uh, and letting them know that that's okay. And that shouldn't stop you from pursuing your dream, uh, is really something that, that I've carried into my job every day. Um, you know, gi giving teachers what they need and students what they need to, to have successful programs. So. Uh, really simple, just to encourage students to follow their dream, follow their passion. Uh, we try to give them avenues to do that in a clear, concise uh, information that leads them to be able to make that dream a reality, but just do it is the best advice I can give. Hey, I don't think I would really say anything different to uh, eight-year-old Chris. Uh, eight-year-old Chris was the kid that every time that airplane flew over, we were in the, the flight path for Chicago O'Hare, and I'm that kid, you know, I'm sure many of you were that kid. Every time there was another plane. I'm, looking, I'm playing baseball, third grade baseball. I'm, they put me in the outfield. I wasn't very good, but here comes the plane. Here comes the ball, but here comes the plane. And I was like taking pri private pilot magazine in like fourth grade, cutting pictures out of it and sticking it on my, on my wall of like different airplanes. So, so there's that. But as for kids today, um, the biggest thing that has, um, I think changed the most lives in my time teaching aviation is getting kids to take that first Young Eagles flight. I have a video I'll be playing in my, in my session coming up and, and I did not expect the answers that I got. And so after all these kids went and they came back and they were just, just beaming. And so I've got the camera right there and my phone's right there. Yeah, so what'd you think? And they're all, one after the other, I couldn't have paid them. This was not scripted. It was, oh my gosh, that's life changing. I, I know what I'm supposed to do now. I know what I want to do now. I was going to go into computer science. I want to be a pilot. Kid after kid after kid after, I, it was amazing. And uh, we, we used uh, um, EAA chapter one in Flaybob when I was in California. And they were super cool too, taking, taking kids up. And that first, the first experience of the Young Eagles flight, 
I, I don't know, how many of you are Young Eagles pilots, by the way, flown, flown people for Young Eagles, just a few out there? Yeah, it's, um, just keep doing what you're doing. It's, it, that changes lives, and then that all of a sudden makes the doors open, and you mentioned drones, and just another little thing that we did for kids, uh, let's say at the high school, we had an FPV drone. It was a DJI drone with the, Google, the, the DJI goggles, and so we would have a kid sit down on the, the bench at lunch, and say, hey, you wanna go for a flight? And this kid's, I uh, sure. So we put these goggles on. I have another a student of mine who's a drone pilot who can actually see what the drone is seeing, plus he's got visual reference. And they would say, okay, stay seated. Say, okay. And we took them up in the drone and flew them around the campus. And they got a bird's eye view. And then on those goggles, we could even switch it so that if they turn their head, it turns that camera. So now they literally are the bird and they can look down and you just, you hear kid after kid just go, oh my gosh. I, it sells itself. You know what I mean? The kid's like, I've got to get into this. I've got to, uh, how do I sign up? It was that easy. And we're just, all we're doing is fostering the passion. And if aviation is not the passion for these kids, then we're just trying to help them find what is their passion. But hopefully it's aviation. Thanks much. So you've got a brain trust here of workforce development um, experienced guys, if you have any questions, obviously you can stop any of us anytime. I enjoy having these conversations with you guys in the hallways. But if there are questions, we've got some mics out in the room, please just raise your hand. Somebody will bring you a mic, and I'm sure these folks would love to answer your questions. Except Charlie. Nope. Yeah. Take the mic to somebody yeah, else. I'm going to jump right in there. Turn that mic off. <laughs> Come on, Bob. So, <clears throat> much like uh, you, I'm a, the father of three children. Um, and I went to, the school I went to, I went to a small Catholic school. We didn't have anything like this, right? Like, I think I've said this before, but the closest thing we had to an elective was you could choose, could choose Bible or confession, and that was it, right? <laughs> the, <laughs> but Which I wish I had choose, this. Just out of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk about that. That's <laughs> it's protected information. The, uh, but I guess the question I have is, I look at the, my area, and even as a person who does a lot of work in this field and, uh, and been connected with it a lot, I look at my school district that my kids are in, they don't, still don't have anything like this. And I guess and I, I, as many of these programs that are, as that are popping up around the country, there's still a lot of areas that need help developing this. And some of it has to start at the, at the, the base level, right? It has to bubble up from, there has to be a passionate teacher in the, in the school that wants to take it on, and other times it can kind of come from top down. But what advice would you give somebody like me, uh, somebody that's interested in getting this started in my area, but I don't really know, who do, I, who do I reach out to? Who do I talk to? Where do you go first? The CTE director will answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, you probably don't know who the CTE director in, in your, is it public school? Okay, well... I would imagine uh, that pretty much every state, every public school district would have a CT director. There are a lot of grants that are out there. Um, like I said, we use the Innovative High School Models Grant to start our aviation program. That was competitive, but in Tennessee, uh, there's a new round of Innovative School Models money where every high school is getting a million dollars over the next four years to do something innovative. Uh, our neighbors, a neighboring uh, suburban school district is gonna be also adding an aviation program. I would imagine that many are gonna do the same. But one thing that districts do get every year, uh, have the opportunity to get, it's, it's not competitive, it's the Perkins Grant. And the Perkins Grant can be used uh, to fund brand new CT programs. Now, it depends on the size of the district, the demographic makeup of your district, how big that grant is. Um, but that is funding that is readily available through the federal government. It's a federal grant that can be used to start brand new CT programs. Um, it could be as simple as reaching out. I don't know if, you're, if your children are enrolled in STEM programs reaching out to the STEM teacher possibly uh, and saying, hey, uh, is, have there been any discussions about potentially, or do you do anything with flight? Do you do anything with aviation in your STEM classes? Uh, so that'd be a, a starting point or emailing the principal uh, of, the, of the building where your kids are at. Uh, but there are grants out there and it's just being intentional with that money uh, and starting a program. This would not have been possible for us, A, without the money, but also partnerships is, is another big thing. I mean, FedEx being in our backyard really helps uh, having that support and having that, that push in the community. Uh, we do intrinsically have that because a lot of FedEx pilots live in our town, so that, that does help. Uh, but again, there's a ton of money out there for CTE, but also specific to aviation, which I'm sure everybody in here knows about. Um, you know, we've actually asked for additional money through other grants um, 
uh, for, to support aviation for sustainability beyond the life of the aviation grant that we got a couple years ago, which sunsets in September. So um, I would say that that's probably a starting point, just reaching out to your principal, suggesting the use of Perkins grant uh, to start a program. We, and, and you, you know, if you have labor market data, which you probably do, readily available to share, uh, because that has to be justifiable through the Perkins grant. But that would be a, a, a tangible, actionable starting point, because we're actually writing those, um, those grants right now in Tennessee. So. Just out of curiosity, are there any more CTE directors or CTE district staff in the room? Okay, so I've already apologized to him because that is the, when I get asked that question, and I get asked that question a lot where I, my default answer is get on your school district's website and figure out who your CTE director is. That, that is an obvious and, and easy first call. They're not gonna, all going to be as cool as Brett is, but that's a, that is a great starting point locally. Um, and uh, of course, um, there are plenty of other, you know, associated resources. But that's, you know, that's a that's a great starting point. And I absolutely agree. I actually had this this very same question from parents, parent after parent after parent at Sun and Fun. How do how do we get this? How where do we go? Um, and of course, we gave our contact information. We can help. But go to your school principal. You know, start there. Go to your PTA. Why don't we have these types of programs? or this kind of educational programming in our school. This is high wage, high demand. This is the next 20 to 30 years. It's a very sustainable program to implement that will have huge benefits for not just my family, but for our community and our students. So absolutely. There's also Civil Air Patrol, as you mentioned, the EAA chapters. So looking <clears throat> for aviation partners in your community. And then, of course, like I said, we're, we're happy to help. I'm just going to throw this out there real quick also that if, you know, if you said to the principal, the school down that way, <laughs> they've got an aviation program, okay? That's never a bad thing to say. Um, or you talk to the CT director about the, you know, the county, you know, across the state and how successful they are and talk to that CT director and then also, you say, they Did were you on know? the local NBC affiliate the other day, and it was good news about the school district. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened in our, in our county. Uh, we have an aviation program. We were on Channel 5 News. They did a story. Uh, all of us CT directors know each other. Boom, next thing we know, there was a post on social media from our rival school district saying that they were hiring an aviation teacher. <laughs> so that's, that's legitimately how it works. I mean, we are in this together. We want to provide kids an opportunity, but there is a competitive nature to it, and that may get the ball rolling also. Thank you, Charlie. Any legitimate questions from the, <laughs> from the audience? Got one over there. You're going to make a statement? Thank you. It's not really a question, but um, I just like to offer, it's not really advice, but some insight. I've spoken to quite a number of instructors, I will say teachers, they're not pilots, but they're curious, how can I do this? And, I, and they're like, but I don't want to become a pilot, but I want to get involved. And I tell them, you don't have to fly. You can go and get your um, BGI and AGI and never step foot in a plane. And they're like, really? I can do that? And I'm like, yes. So you got to kind of keep an open mind, think outside of the box. And um, that's one way to navigate and get instructors without them necessarily being pilots, that the knowledge is out there that they can teach. I've noticed that there's such a shortage of instructors in aviation when it comes to the university level. They're hiring like crazy. And where are we going to find these people? I don't know. But um, at the STEM level, definitely, you just tell, encourage people, get your um, BGI, AGI, and give it a try. I was asked one time about hiring because I used to do a lot of instructor hiring and standardization and oversight in a previous life, if you have to choose between competence or passion and you can only pick one of the two, which one would you pick? And I would always pick passion. Um, I've met a lot of competent people who really hate their life, um, hate what they do, um, but they're very good at it. Um, but if somebody is passionate 
to your point, Pamela, if they really, if they want it, if they see it, I would work with that person a thousand times over the person who on paper looks like the obvious candidate because I can do a lot with somebody who wants to do it. Um, I would always hire passion over um, paper competence, but that's a, a very valid point. Any other questions or? Well, let me leave you with this one thought. No, no, see, you. come on, man. Okay. <laughs> Since she's wearing a red shirt, I guess we'll let her talk. Yes. All righty. So in a high school level, um, what kind of initiatives do you think that are most effective, you know, to get those students introduced to those aviation careers that are available? Because sometimes that's the problem that they're not even aware of, like, all these potential careers. I think that is the problem. I mean, that is the, we, we, we said the challenge is we need more people, but if you, if you deconstruct that, the real problem is that there, the, the vast majority of the populace does not know the opportunities that are available to them. I think that's a very valid point. You guys want to take that? Yeah, I know you said high school, but really it starts all the way down to kindergarten. Um, you know, we implement uh, STEM programs K through five where students get a STEM education every year, uh, K through five, and then it's an elective in, in sixth through eighth grade, obviously an elective at the high school level. But one thing we do in the middle school level is we do aptitude and interest surveys. It's a state law in seventh or eighth grade. Um, and so students uh, take a, we use a platform called Navians where students take uh, aptitude and interest surveys that shows A, what they're good at, and B, uh, what they're interested in and kind of marries the two and then also spits out recommended careers. Well, that also ties into the career days that we do uh, in the fall of their eighth grade year before they choose courses for high school. And I know I keep mentioning FedEx, but what FedEx does is they kind of take over the career day. They bring, uh, for the aviation session, they bring somebody from all different fields within aviation. Uh, so students that are thinking that they're signing up to hear about being a pilot, they hear about all the other fields that are offered within aviation at the same time. So that could be maintenance, it could be any of these other jobs. Again, I'm not an aviator, I'm not a pilot, um, so to excuse me there. Yeah, uh, we'll but, forgive you this time, but this is an uh, annual conference, I, so next this, year we're going to need you might, to show up. Yeah, I might need to be. Um, but really, Maybe that's Bob, what we do. You can talk uh, to him afterward. Partnerships with people like FedEx, where they can show you the wide variety of all the different careers, has really helped us out. And then building it up all the way from kindergarten up to ninth grade, and vertically aligning all that to what's available to them at the high school level. I just wanted to leave this with one thought that was an eye-opening thing to me. Um, just show of hands quick in the audience, how many of you have a hard time relating to kids today? That should be all of you. Um, I, I, like, what are they thinking? What's going on? Why do they think that's important? But then I would also, because I was just thinking about this while they were all answering the what would you say to, some, to your younger self question, how many of you would also tell your younger self the same thing these people said? Maybe you're not that dissimilar from those kids you don't think you can relate to. Maybe you have more in common with them and you see that they use technology and maybe you didn't or they use it differently than you did or they grew up in a different culture than you did. But at the end of the day, if we're saying that if, that, if what these people have said about their, what they would say to their younger self, if that's resonating with you, then it, it may be that we have more in common with these young people than we think we do, especially when it comes to sharing our passion with them. And so if there's a takeaway from, for me, from what do we do about workforce, it's that we engage with these kids. Don't wait, them, don't wait for them to call you and show up or, or their parent to call and say, what's a discovery flight? And I know a lot of you are doing this already. It's not a condemnation. I'm just saying there is clearly more we can do because there's still so many people out there who don't know how fun it is to do what we do for a living. And it's our responsibility to fix that. Thank you guys very much for participating in this panel. And thank you to these great and, and, and kind people for presenting to you.